Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Mailbag, the show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. How do you get one of your mailbag questions on our show? Simple. You simply email us to this address, collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, every day, Monday through Friday on Movie Talk, we take a couple of mailbag questions, one or two. And then here on the weekends, on Saturday and Sunday, all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campia. I am the senior producer over here at Collider Video, and I'm so glad you decided to make this a part of your day. It is Saturday morning recording here in the Collider Video offices, and I am all by myself. Uh, nobody else is around. Surprise, surprise. Nobody's working on Saturday morning. Except me, that is. I'm here because I love doing mailbag. All right. So with all that out of the way, let's get to the first mailbag question of the day. And the first question today comes to us from Corey Eltime, who writes, With the recent bad reception of the new Fantastic Four movie, I have been reading way more comments online from people saying how Fox should sell the Fantastic Four rights back to Marvel, just like what Sony did with Spider-Man. I also read people saying how it would be better if Fox would just flat out return the rights of its Marvel characters, the Fantastic Four, as well as the X-Men, who I absolutely adore, back to Marvel Studios. I just wanted to know what your guys' thoughts on this topic. Thanks for all that you guys do and stay awesome. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Corey. Um, a couple things to address here. First, in your email, you mentioned that um, there are some people saying they should, uh, that Fox should sell the rights to Fantastic Four back to Marvel like Sony sold the rights back to Spider-Man. That's incorrect. Sony did not sell the rights to Spider-Man back to Marvel. S Spider-Man, despite what you hear some people say, Spider-Man still belongs to Sony. Sony owns Spider-Man. Now, what Sony and Marvel did, for those of you who aren't really clear on this, what Sony and Marvel did is they reached a deal where... Um, Marvel is now allowed to have Spider-Man, Sony's Spider-Man, appear in their Marvel Cinematic Universe. And now Sony, when they make their Spider-Man standalone films, are able to use characters in the Marvel Universe that otherwise would only have been allowed to appear in Marvel movies. So it's a two-way deal. So when... For instance, Captain America Civil War comes out and Spider-Man makes an appearance. That's Marvel's movie. That is Marvel's movie. Uh, Sony gets some say in how their character is used and how Spider-Man is going to be used. But overall, that is Marvel's movie. On the other hand, when the new standalone Spider-Man movies comes out, make no mistake, those are Sony's movies. Those standalone Spider-Man movies belong to Sony. Now, Kevin Feige is going to be one of the producers on those as well. So just as Sony is going to have a say in what Spider-Man does in the Marvel movies, even though those are Marvel movies, Kevin Feige will have a say in the Spider-Man movies, even though the ultimate final decision and authority and everything that has to do with Spider-Man is still belongs to Sony. And Sony will be allowed to use some characters from Marvel that otherwise they wouldn't have been able to use. And just as Sony will have some say in over how Spider-Man is used in Marvel's movies, I'm sure Marvel will have a say in how their other characters are used in Spider-Man movies. It's a partnership. Um, so just any this idea that Sony sold Spider-Man back to uh, Marvel, they did not. They Sony still owns Spider-Man. So if the next Spider-Man movie comes out and it totally sucks, it's Sony's fault. Uh, so let's just get that clear right now. Or maybe it'll be awesome. I, I mean, I hope it's going to be awesome. I really like what Sony did with the first Amazing Spider-Man with uh, Andrew Garfield. I thought the movie was great. Second one was not great, but I thought that first one was great. So I think they uh, I think they have a pretty decent handle on what they're doing with their Spider-Man character. Well, let's just see how that, that all pans out. Now, getting back to the main crux of your question, which is about, you know, we, we've talked about this before on Mailbag and, and on Movie Talk a, a lot, but now the landscape is changing, isn't it? We've talked a lot before about, should Fox just sell the rights to Fantastic Four back to Marvel? Um, it's an interesting question. Now, traditionally, what I have always said is, no, I, I don't want Fantastic Four going back to Marvel. I just don't. Um, because, number one, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is starting to get way crowded. Like, really crowded. And I, and I know I'm not in the majority on this. I know I am in the minority when it comes to this opinion. But my opinion is, why the flippin' F does every superhero movie have to be in a universe where 5,000 other superheroes are? Like, why? Why can't, there be a, why can't there be superhero movies now where the superheroes are actually special? 
Because it's like, you know, in The Amazing Spider-Man and in the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man, Spider-Man was special. Because he is this, what I call the, the, um, the fantastic within the mundane. The mundane being the regular world. And Spider-Man being, in the original Sam Raimi ones, was like, it was so unbelievable. Because here's this person who had extraordinary abilities that is so outside of our daily experience. In Spider-Man, Spider-Man was the fantastic within the mundane. And I loved that about Spider-Man. I love that about a lot of superhero films. But now, and I, everybody knows I love the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I, I love it. I adore it. But that being said, everything great has a downside. And everything horrible has an upside. But with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the downside uh, um, amongst all of its greatness, or one of the things of the downside of amongst all of Marvel's greatness, is the fact that it, nobody's special. There, there's nothing special. Oh, look, there's there's a guy who's lifting a car over his head. Oh, hum. That's normal now because in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, there's 5,000 superheroes running around. There, there's no sense of the fantastic within the mundane anymore there. And it's just getting too crowded. And I like Fantastic Four, and, and not the newest movie, but I like in general the Fantastic Four, and I want to see Fantastic Four movies. And if they go to, to Marvel, you've heard me and John Schnepp both say this many, many times. We're going to get one Fantastic Four movie every five, six, seven years because Marvel is, they're gearing up to produce three movies a year. But, and that's going to be a maximum capacity. They won't be able to do any more than that, I don't think. So once they're doing three movies per year, well, you got Captain America, you got Thor, you got Hulk, you got Iron Man, you got Avengers, you got Guardians of the Galaxy, you're going to have Black Widow, you got now Ant-Man, you're going to have now Doctor Strange, you're going to have now Black Panther, you're going to have, I mean, they just got so much. So when are we going to get, when, when, when are we going to get Fantastic Four movies? You know, the, one of the great things about this deal with Sony is that Sony maintains control of Spider-Man. That means they can make sp the Spider-Man movies. You know, next year is amazing because I think next year we're getting like six or seven comic book movies. And I think that's awesome. But if everything was under Marvel's roof, we'd be getting three, maybe, maybe four. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And the fact that other studios have control over some of the Marvel properties has been a good thing. Look, if Fox didn't have control of the X-Men, we never would have had the first X-Men movie, which is awesome. We never would have had X-Men 2, which I still think is one of the greatest comic book movies ever made. We never would have had X-Men First Class, and we never would have had X-Men Days of Future Past, which I think most of us will agree was freaking awesome. We would never have had those films if they were all just under Marvel, Marvel's roof. Plus, then, there'd be very little special about the X-Men because they'd be running around in a universe with 50,000 other characters that have superpowers. And, and we lose that sense. Like, there's something to be said about not having every freaking comic book character in a giant shared cinematic universe. There's something to be said for that. And I like what Marvel's doing, but I also don't want them to get so freaking overcrowded that we can't deal with it anymore. Now, with Fantastic Four, though, th something has changed. And what has changed now is that Fox has produced a piece of crap in the new Fantastic Four. This is their third piece of crap Fantastic Four film in a row. Now, granted, I said this on um, our review and I'll stick by it. I think the new Fantastic Four is better than the previous two Fantastic Four movies, but it's still a piece, of, it's still awful. It's still a piece of crap. It's terrible. So this changes the dynamic a bit. Now, can Fox, and, and it looks like originally they were predicting 40 to 45 million for an opening weekend. Now, by the time you see this, the opening weekend numbers may have come in. As of right now, the opening weekend numbers are not in. At, at a projected 40 to 45 million opening box office weekend, that gives you the chance that it could hit 50. And if it hit 50, I said, I think no matter how bad the movie is, Fox will take another crack at this. Because if it has a $50 million opening weekend, that will tell Fox, people are interested in checking out a Fantastic Four film. Now let's try this again and maybe see if the fourth time will be a charm. However, with the outrageous negative word of mouth, with the tweet from the movie's director who said, this isn't even my movie. I don't... Basically, the director, just Josh Trank, just tweeted, this movie is no good because it's not the movie I wanted. This is not the movie I put together. With all that happening, now it's looking like Fantastic Four will be lucky if it gets 30 million. 
it'll be lucky. I mean, we'll have to see the final numbers, which will probably come out tomorrow morning, being Sunday tomorrow. Um, but, you know, that changes the landscape. If a Fantastic Four comes out now and makes $30 million, where is the motivation for Fox Studios to hold on to the Fantastic Four rights? Are they interested in making more Fantastic Four movies after they put out three turds in a row? I don't think they will be. And at this point, I'm going to have to say, unless a director like a James Cameron comes in, who Fox will not interfere with, Fox will not interfere with James Cameron, or a Brian Singer wants to take over Fantastic Four, Fox won't interfere with a director of the caliber and of the power of, of a Brian Singer. Unless a director like that wants to take over Fantastic Four, I can't see Fox moving forward. You know, despite the fact that I have always said Fox needs to stay on Fantastic Four. Fantastic Four needs to stay at Fox because I think they're going to improve it. I think they're going to do a job. Well, now the situation's changed. They put out the third piece of turd in a row. I don't think they're going to be interested in moving forward with it any further. And at this point, yeah, maybe it'll be best for Fox to let go of Fantastic Four. If they're going to lose a ton of money on this particular incarnation of Fantastic Four and lose a bunch of money on it, then I can't see them being really all that excited about holding on to it. I think it's time to let it go. Now, all that being said, Fox just gave us an amazing X-Men Days of Future Past. And we are all going out of our minds with how good they seem to be doing with Deadpool. I mean, we're all excited about Deadpool. We think it looks like Fox has done a fantastic job with Deadpool. And if they can do something good with Gambit, I mean, then, then there's no reason they can't maintain this X-Men universe of theirs ongoing. But yeah, maybe it is time for them to let Fantastic Four go. Because, you know, three strikes are out, dude. All right, let's move on. The next question comes to us from Tyler Adams. And Tyler Adams writes, I'm wondering what's going on with the film Absolutely Anything, starring Simon Pegg. Internet Movie Database says it's coming out this Wednesday, August 12th, but I've seen zero marketing for this movie. No TV spots, no internet ads, uh, basically a whole bunch of silence on the movies coming from the studio right now. And I haven't even seen the trailer play in a theater. Maybe the studio knows it's not very good? Seems like an easy film to sell on the cast alone, especially Robin Williams. Thanks for all you do. I love the show and look forward to it every day. Well, thanks a lot uh, for the question. Tyler, yeah, I remember... Uh, way back in the day, this was going back a while, when we first talked on a movie talk about this new movie being put together with Simon Pegg called Absolutely Anything. Now, for those of you who don't know much about the film, the, the, the premise of the movie is kind of rather interesting. It's a little bit like Bruce Almighty, but basically this alien race, who are all voiced by the Monty Python crew, by the way, uh, which is awesome. So there's this alien race who passes judgment on Earth. That Earth needs to be destroyed. It's just, it's just a hopeless case, this planet Earth. So what they do is they say, but we're going to give it a test. We're going to endow one human being with absolute power. And if they use it for good, then <coughs> we will spare the Earth. And if they use it for evil, we will destroy the Earth. So sure enough, Simon Pegg, this character, this average Joe, Simon Pegg gets selected and he gets, you know, imbued with unbelievable universe altering power. And he discovers he has all this power. And now the race is on. Will he use his power for good or will he use his power for evil? And in the midst of it, he, one of his things he, he makes come to pass is that he can understand his dog talking. And the dog is voiced by Robin Williams. I think this is probably the last project um, from Robin Williams that, that will come out. Uh, Kate Beckinsale's in it. Rob Riggle's in it. So it's a pretty decent cast. And it's a pretty cool sounding premise. But you're wondering... It's supposed to be coming out this week. I haven't seen any ads. Here's why. It's not getting a North American release. It's not being released in North America. I, I think it's being released in about 15 international markets, including the UK, France, uh, some other markets like that. But um, to the best of my understanding, it is not being picked up in the US. So you will probably be able to catch absolutely anything at some point on iTunes or Amazon Prime or Google Play Store or something like some kind of uh, streaming service, VOD will be coming. And to be honest with you, despite the fact that the premise is so cool, 
I, I do feel like we've seen this movie before and the trailers weren't great. You can find the trailers online if you go on YouTube. Just search for absolutely anything Simon Pegg or absolutely anything movie trailer or whatever and you'll find the trailers and they're not really all that good. A couple of grins, a couple of smiles in the trailer, but nothing all that good. Especially Robin Williams, the dog saying to Simon Pegg, Shagger! Shagger! That was, that was pretty funny. But... Yeah, there is no North American release for the movie, which probably suggests that no studio or no distribution company thought this would be any good or would find an audience. So, But if you're curious about the film, VOD, check it out. It should be available fairly soon, so keep your eyes open for that. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Wendy Oxford. And Wendy writes... Hey guys, I wanted to say that I love the show being available again in podcast form. However, I heard you say in the show that the podcast will be available for a limited time only. Why a limited time only? Thanks again, and I love the show. Well, thanks a lot, Wendy. And we've been talking about this um, for a little while, both on my personal social media channels and my personal YouTube channel. We've mentioned it a little bit um, here on our uh, Collider programming. Yeah, so we faced a dilemma when we moved over. Some of you have heard this before, so my, I apologize if you're just hearing me repeat things. When we were moving over to Collider, we had a, a dilemma. Look, making an audio podcast is cheap and easy. You sit down with a microphone and a laptop. You don't need lights. You don't need cameras. You don't need a set. You don't need a crew. You don't need anything. You just sit down with a microphone, turn it on, start talking. Simple, cheap, easy. Um, the problem is we don't produce podcasts. We produce... Um, what we like to consider, we hopefully, a uh, high-end um, video programming on YouTube, you know, with, with a very expensive set and equipment and gear, cameras, lights, a crew, all that kind of stuff. And those are expensive to make. And the way we make our money um, is by people watching YouTube videos. That's how we make up for that money is by people watching YouTube videos. Now at AMC... That wasn't a problem because AMC didn't care if we made money. The whole idea of AMC Movie News at the time was just to promote the brand of AMC because AMC's product was not our videos. AMC's product was not our podcasts. AMC's product was movie tickets and popcorn and soda in the movie theaters. That was their product. So our shows were just kind of a way of promoting you know, the movie industry in general. And that's all they cared about because they didn't need to make money off what we were doing. Now though, so, so since money wasn't an issue, we could put it out on podcast form, didn't matter. However, the problem we faced in, um, you know, when I decided, when I was able to bring the whole crew over to Collider with me, the problem we face is that now our videos are our product. This is our product. And therefore, that's where we need to make our money. And podcasts don't make any money. Now, there are some podcast sponsors out there, but they pay next to nothing. And that's okay that they pay next to nothing because for podcasts, it costs next to nothing to make them. And so that's not a big deal. However, we don't sit down around a table with two microphones and just with no cameras, lights, no crew, no anything, and just record low cost podcasts. We our shows are very expensive to produce and therefore, you know, we can't just put out our podcasts for people to listen to instead of watching our videos because if they're listening to our podcasts instead of watching our videos, we're losing money. And that was our dilemma. Now, a lot of you guys uh, have been emailing and messaging us asking about, you know, saying you really loved the podcast and you relied on the podcast and that, you know, it was just a lot easier fit into your day for the podcast and that you miss them. So we wanted to find a way, well, how can we kill two birds with one stone. How can we give our audience what they want, their po the podcasts, and meet what they want, while at the same time meeting our financial realities? And the fact, look, we gotta make money on these things and we're not making money off podcasts. What do we do? So came up with this idea and I went on my YouTube page to pitch the idea to you guys to see what you thought. And basically I said is, what if we put together a subscription service for a podcast? Because look, your favorite podcast that you listen to, generally speaking, you're getting four episodes a month. We are putting out anywhere between 40 and 50 episodes a month. So we thought, what I proposed was, what if we put out uh, a subscription-based podcast service where you pay anywhere between, like, say, $3 and $5 a month, okay, for 40 to 50 podcasts. So, like, less than the cost of a soda at a movie and you'll get 40 to 50 podcasts a month. Plus, I said, what if we do like bonus 
podcasts that are audio only, only exclusively available on the podcast format. Like, you know, me and Schnepp have been talking about this. Campy and Schnepp after dark or some, something, some kind of nonsense like that. Um, we would do some special productions. Would that, and I asked you guys on my YouTube channel, I said, would that be appealing to you? Do you think that makes sense or do you think that's a terrible idea? And honestly, guys, in today's age where everybody wants effing everything for free on the internet, everything should be free on the internet. I honestly thought 50% of you guys would hate the idea and 50% of you would love it. I was blown away. Like 95% at least of you guys wrote to me, tweeted to me, everything said, dude, that sounds fair. That sounds totally fair. Three to five bucks a month. Keep it, the price really low. I would subscribe to that for 40, you know, 30, 40 hours of entertainment a month. Do it. So that's what we're doing. We are developing an app right now for Windows, iOS, Android, Amazon, um, where you subscribe using the app and you get all these podcasts every single month and it'll be somewhere between three and five dollars. I don't I don't know where it's going to land yet. And that helps us keep the lights on. It helps us being able to keep producing the shows and allows us to deliver the podcast. So we it's going to take another month or two for them to fully build the app that we need. So we thought in the meantime, since our audience and our viewers are asking so much for the audio podcast, let's just make the audio podcast available for free for now. Um, and since they're asking for it, they want it, let's make it available because we listen to you guys. And so anyway, that's a very uh, long answer to that. I hope you find that. See, that's the nice thing about Mailbag. Mailbag, we get to do a little bit of behind the scenes stuff. We don't just talk movie industry. We let you ask us questions about what's going on here uh, at the Collider Video Studio. So I hope that answers your question. I hope you guys will like the service. And, um, and, and selfishly, I really hope you guys will want to jump on board with it and help support what it is we do. It's not cheap uh, doing what we do here. It's actually fairly expensive. You know, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to put these programs together. And uh, if uh, it would just be awesome if you guys decided to support what we're doing and help us out with that. Thank you so much for the question. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Ryan Proctor. And Ryan Proctor writes, Hey guys, I have a curious question that relates to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I'm a fan of the Jules Verne novel as well as the film from the 1950s, and I would love to see a live-action remake. Over the years, I've heard many rumors, including a David Fincher-directed film, and then those rumors died. Do you think there is any chance that Disney will make another live-action 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea film? And if so, will we have to wait a while? Thanks, guys, and keep up the good work. Yeah, um, you mentioned it before. I think it was about five years ago, maybe a little bit longer. But director David Fincher, who did like The Social Network and uh, Gone Girl and a lot of other great films, uh, he was supposed to do a 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea for Disney. But what happened was, uh, David Fincher tells the story way better than I can relay it, but David Fincher tells the story about how he, he and Disney just couldn't get on the same page. Like, for instance, he had the crazy idea of wanting Dr. Pierre to be played by a French guy. In incredible idea. Like, I have no problem changing out nationalities for characters. Everybody knows I have no problem with that. But what's wrong with the idea of going with you? Neither. So I'm fine with that. David Fincher thought, hey, let's make Dr. Pierre a French guy. And Disney just couldn't get their heads around it. And, you know, and Fincher tells a story... I just knew it was going to be a casting battle that I would have a really hard time getting the actors I wanted in these roles to make Disney happy, make them feel at ease. And you know, full marks to Disney as well. I get it. Disney wants to make sure if they put a hundred million dollars into a movie that they are going to be able to make that money back and make a profit. And if they had worries that the cast that Fincher wanted at the time was going to hurt them making money, then I don't blame them. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, nobody's the bad guy here. I'm not blaming anybody. But yeah, that's kind of how that David Fincher, Walt Disney, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea thing kind of sank, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, but now there was another 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea movie. This one was actually a uh, straight to TV movie starring Michael Caine. It was in 1997. It starred Michael Caine and it starred uh, as Captain Nemo. And I, the, the dude from Grey's Anatomy, Patrick Dempsey, I believe was Dr. Pierre uh, in it. And that was a straight to TV movie. Wasn't all that good. Um, but it's there and I'm sure you can find it. Now, as far as another one being done, hey, you know what? Disney's always looking for, well, every studio is always looking for what can be our next franchise. Up 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is something that 
opens itself up and lends itself to being a franchise if done right. So I don't have much doubt that at some point Disney will take a crack at 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea again. They've already tried. They were going to move forward with it with David Fincher. So that means it's on their radar. Um, so I think it will happen again. But honestly, they're so wrapped up with so many things right now. It might be a little while that we have to wait before we can actually see it again. So I'm not sure when, but I feel pretty confident that it will happen. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Borgi Valbuena. I'm sorry, Borgi, if I'm missing up your name. My apologies. I watch your show every freaking day, and recently you talked about how good CG can be. Many people still praise James Cameron's avatar for having great CGI, but no one seems to talk about how great the CGI in Gravity is. Most of the things uh, that movie, most of the things in that movie that people thought were practical were actually CG. My question is, have our thoughts on what is good special effects and what is not been misplaced? Well, thanks a lot for the question, Borgie. Yeah, and there's this great video. We talked about it on Movie Talk the other day. Um, there's a fantastic video floating around YouTube right now, um, and I cannot remember the name of the guy who made it. But anyway... And basically, it's called uh, CGI's Ruining Movies, except they're not, except it's not. Look look it up on YouTube. It's really fascinating. It's about a seven-minute long video. And it just talks about visual effects and how people say, CG is ruining movies, when really it's not. It's just you only notice bad CG. You're not noticing good CG. And one of the great examples that he brings up in that YouTube video is that gravity, where a lot of people thought so much of that was just practical effects, and it's all CG. Even when Sandra Bullock is just sitting in her capsule, you know, and it just looks, yeah, there's the wall, there's uh, some things on a shelf, blah, blah, blah. It's all CG. It's crazy. The use of CG in gravity is brilliant. Now, that being said, I used to work in the computer graphics um, industry. I was a producer and a, and a client services director uh, working uh, with a visual effects company. And here's the thing, though. Stationary stuff is easier to do than than creatures and things moving, than things breathing, things that have a life. So like, for instance, while the, the CG in Gravity is awesome and awe-inspiring and takes an incredible artist and team of artists to make that look as good as it does, that same team will tell you it's, it's a less challenging to do that than it is to have CG creatures that look real in a real environment moving around all that kind of stuff too. So Yes, do we underappreciate great CG in a lot of movies because we just don't notice it's there? Yeah, because if your CG is done really awesome, the audience won't know it. Like, that video also points out the new George Miller Mad Max film. I was like, oh, it's all practical. There's a ton of CGI in Mad Max Fury Road and a ton of compositing and a ton of digital effects. But because it's done so well, we don't notice it. And that's... Kind of a weird thing. You're in an industry where if you do your job really well, nobody will know that you did anything. And so that, that's, that's kind of weird, but it's also kind of cool at the same time. So no, I don't think we're misplacing our praise. Like James Cameron's Avatar, you can't overpraise what they did in that. It's astounding what they accomplished in James Cameron's Avatar. But we are underselling other great CGI work because it's done so great, we don't even notice that it's there. So a fantastic question. Thanks for bringing it up. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Scott Allen. And Scott Allen writes, Hey guys, love the show and have watched every episode since I found you a couple months ago. Well, thanks a lot, Scott. Really appreciate the support. Do you still buy Josh Trank's reasons for leaving Star Wars? Or do you think Disney had second thoughts after seeing what happened with his film? Well, for those of you who don't know what uh, Scott is talking about, uh, director Josh Trank, who did a magnificent job on Chronicle, uh, he is the director of record of uh, Fantastic Four. But what we have learned is that the Fantastic Four movie we see on screen is not Josh Trank's movie. He, the, Fox Studios hijacked that movie from him. They shot a bunch of it without him. They kicked him out of the editing room. They, they basically made a movie that, that was not his movie. Um, and there's a lot of drama going on about that right now. Anyway, Josh Trank was also attached to direct a, uh, a Star Wars anthology film, the one that's going to come after Rogue One. So we're going to have Star Wars Episode 7, then there's going to be Star Wars Anthology Rogue One, then Star Wars Episode 8, and then Star Wars Anthology, the Josh Trank movie. And 
Josh Trank um, quit, at least the public statement was that he quit um, the Star Wars movie. And what he said when when he stepped down from the Star Wars movie, he put out a statement that said, because a lot of us were thinking, hmm, did he really quit? Or was this Disney kicking him off? Or all this kind of stuff. So, But what he said in his statement was, look, I've been under such powerful, incredible scrutiny for the last four years. It's been really difficult. It's been really hard. I just need to go back and make some smaller movies again. And at the time, even myself was like, I don't know. I mean, man, you get offered Star Wars. I don't know if you walk away from that. But now, today, as we have all these sources, including ones that I have personally that have been reporting me, people close to the production of Fantastic Four and everything, and we're reading other stories like the ones in Entertainment Weekly and others, we are finding out just how much of a living hell Josh Trank went through in his battles with the studio and his battles with other things, trying to get that movie made, and then it came out to be the movie he didn't make in the first place and all that kind of stuff. Now that we know what a living hell the last couple of years have been for Joss Trank trying to make this movie. Now, as I look back now at Josh Trank talking about why he stepped away from Star Wars, now I totally buy it. I completely believe it. I think you'd have to be, be naive not to believe him at this point. Because now that all, because at the time, when Trank made those comments before, at the time, we didn't know about all this unbelievable battle going on between him and Fox and what a nightmare it was for him. We, we didn't know about any of that. So people like me, we just sat back going, well, I guess I believe him. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But man, this sounds fishy. But now that we have new information and we can look at this whole situation in a totally new context... Um, and I, I have sources at Disney and none of them have ever contradicted what Josh, Josh Trank said about why he left and the fact that he made the decision to leave. None of them have ever contradicted that. And now it all makes perfect sense. Now it makes perfect sense to me that what you do is you have a young guy. Like, so I think Josh Trank was, is only like 31 years old now. Like he's younger than a lot of you guys watching the show. And... You know, after going through what he went through, the idea of jumping back into bed with another, even if Disney is a totally different studio than Fox, and I'm not trying to paint Fox as the bad guy. Fox does a lot of awesome things. This is just, you know, a, a bad situation. Um, I think I can totally understand him not wanting to jump back on to a mega high, you think Fantastic Four is high profile. Oh my goodness. Forget about it. Doing a Star Wars movie and understanding the experience he just had, I totally buy, not only do I buy him stepping away from it, I always thought he was insane for walking off of a Star Wars movie. Now I totally get, and I totally agree with him. I totally agree with his decision to leave the Star Wars movie because man, you need to step back and catch your breath and see where that goes. And uh, and, and so yeah, I, I do believe it. If, if anything, all the recent events just reaffirm that I, I think it points to him that yeah, he was being legit telling us why he left. All right, let's move on to the next question. Two questions left for today. And this one comes from Brent Garrison, who writes, Contrary to Fox's treatment of the Fantastic Four, Warner Brothers seems pretty confident in Batman vs. Superman. There are posters, trailers, stills, and articles detailing the film far before its release date. They even offered free tickets to a week early screening of the movie to the thousands of fans who attended the IMAX trailer event. Editing, sound mixing, scoring, CGI, etc. isn't even complete yet. How can a studio possibly be so confident in a film that's that far out? Well, thanks a lot for the question, Brent. And, well, a lot more is done than you think. Now, don't forget, Batman vs. Superman, when they started shooting, was supposed to come out weeks ago. I mean, when they started shooting that movie, they had a release date... And it was weeks ago. This movie was already supposed to be out and in theaters as of right now. It's already supposed to be in theaters. So they have had plenty of time to make and develop and put their movie together. Now, as a matter of fact, what we found out the other day was that they did their first private screening of the film for a bunch of the upper management and executives of Warner Brothers. They did a screening of the film. So is the film 100% complete? I'm sure it's not 100% complete, but they've got their edit, they've got their cut. I'm sure a lot of the CG work is already done. I'm sure there's still some more to do. I'm sure a lot of the scores are already done. Because remember, again, their original timeline, this movie is already supposed to be in theaters. So they played this 
Um, they did the screening for the upper management and the executives at Warner Brothers already. I wish I could have been there. And the word coming out was that the Warner executives and everything gave the film a standing ovation when it was done. And then started talking about Ben Affleck for directing three Batman movies and all this crazy stuff came out. Now, that excites me because everybody knows how excited I am for Batman versus Superman. I'm losing my mind. But let's keep this in mind too. There was a similar story that came out about Man of Steel like four months or five months before the movie got released. That a screening was held for the executives of Warner and a lot of the employees at Warner Brothers and they all gave it a standing ovation and everybody lost their minds over it. Now, I saw the movie and I think Man of Steel is a masterpiece. I really do. I think that every time I watch that movie, to me, it gets better and better and better. I just, that movie is a brilliant movie. But that being said, there are many people out there who do not appreciate the film like I do. So just because Warner Brothers stood up and gave a standing ovation to a Warner Brothers movie doesn't necessarily mean you will like it or that your buddy will like it or that my wife will like it or whatever, right? So while it is a good sign that Warner Brothers loves their own movie, let's remember it is their own movie. So let's not get too excited about the idea of Warner Brothers executives giving them themselves a standing ovation. So let's not get too excited about that. It's still good news. I mean, it's still way better than hearing the Warner Brothers executive saw a cut of uh, Batman versus Superman and uh, they're going back for reshoots. Now, that would be horrible news. But so this is good news. Let's just keep it in perspective and not get too excited. All right, last question of the day. And the last question today comes to us from Joel. And Joel writes... Greetings, Collider crew. What are your thoughts on the Man from Uncle trailers, and how do you think the movie will turn out? I think this is a great start for uh, Henry Cavill, as he is sort of becoming a movie star. Also, I think this movie looks great as a summer movie, continuing the spy-slash-action films of the summer this year so far, with James Bond coming up next, and Mission Impossible Rogue Nation recently. Thanks, and keep up the amazing work. Well, first thing, I don't think Henry Cavill is be becoming a movie star. Henry Cavill is a movie star. He, he is a bona fide movie star right now. It keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and all that kind of stuff. And that's wonderful. Army Hammer. Um, I like the trailers for Man From U.N.C.L.E. I haven't been blown away by the trailers for Man From U.N.C.L.E., but I like the trailers. Now, I have seen the movie and there is a review embargo, so I'm not going to go into any detail. I will simply tell you I loved the film. I loved The Man from U.N.C.L.E. I'm not going to go into why I loved it. I'm not going to talk about the things that worked or didn't work for me and all that. Kind of, I'm not going to go into any of that because there is a re review embargo. We will do a review this coming week when the review embargo lifts. I think the review embargo lifts Monday or Tuesday or something like that. And once the review embargo lifts, I will give my review. I will just simply say right now that I love the film and I'll go into why later. Um, and I, I think you're going to like it. But I also think the movie's going to get killed. I think it's going to get killed because it's it's not, like I said, the trailers for me have been good, but they haven't been great. And it's opening against Straight Outta Compton. And Straight Outta Compton, I think, is going to get a lot more attention. And I and I, I, I really like Straight Outta Compton, too. Uh, if you guys saw my review, I really like that one, too. So, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how the movie will do, but I hope it does well. I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I hope it does really well. So... Anyway, folks, that will do it for this installment of Collider Mailbag. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Hey, listen, don't forget. If you love movie news and staying up to date, not just on movie news, but entertainment news, you've got to bookmark www.collider.com. Steve Frosty Weintraub and his entire team of writers over there do an amazing job keeping you up to date, minute by minute, on what's going on in the world of entertainment. If you love reading good websites, bookmark Collider. Dot com. And don't forget, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button. It'll keep you up to date on everything going on and all the stuff that we're doing over here at Collider Video. And did you know that we have an Instagram page on Collider Video? Our uh, office administrator, Wendy, takes tons of pictures every day. It feels like every day she's putting up pictures on her Instagram account. So you can follow us on Instagram. If you use Instagram, simply at 
Collider Video. Also, you can follow Collider Video on Twitter at Collider Video. Just follow us on all the different things. And of course, you can follow me on all the various social media channels, just at John Campy on Facebook and on Twitter. You know, a lot of announcements and things coming up about Collider Video and all the stuff that we're doing with our shows, I'll often announce it first to the people who follow me on social media. So check it out if you're interested in that. So that'll do it for me, guys, for this Saturday installment of Collider Mailbag. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. I really appreciate it. My name is John Campion. Until next time. Bye-bye.